Good to see everybody. Everybody have a good afternoon? Good. We did too. It's always good when you're able to be with a grandchild, right? Fabulous. All right, if you looked at your bulletin, you saw that it's on purpose. So we're going to talk a little bit about purpose tonight. We're going to talk about, first of all, our Lord and Savior. We want to talk about Him. He's my favorite subject. One of these days we're going to do a long series just on Jesus. Love talking about Jesus. So let's look at Jesus. Let's look at His purpose. And then we'll look at ourselves. But first of all, to define what purpose is, go to dictionary.com. It is the reason why something is born or the reason why something exists. And so what, that's what that means. Jesus had a purpose. Even being God in the flesh, He had a purpose. And as you read throughout the gospel accounts, you see multiple pur uh, purposes, actually. And so let's look at those. The very first one, I hope that you have your Bible handy. we got a lot of reading tonight. John chapter 1, verse 18. The very first one purpose that Jesus had was to explain the Father, to explain God. John 1, and verse 18 tells us that. And there it says, no one has seen God at any time, the only begotten Son who is in the bosom of the Father. He has declared Him. And so He has declared the Father. That was the purpose of why He was here. Well, how did He do that? How did He declare the Father? Well, the Hebrew writer says in chapter 1, in verses 1 through 3, how that was done. How He was able to declare the Father. So Hebrews chapter 1, beginning with verse 1, God who at various times and in various ways spoke in times past to the fathers by the prophets has in these last days spoken to us by his Son, whom he has appointed heir of all things, through whom also he made the worlds, who being the brightness of his glory and the express image, New King James Version says, of his person. We'll just stop there. The express image there in the New King James Version actually means exact representation. And so how did he explain God? How did he reveal God? He was the exact representation. So if you see me, you've seen the Father. And so, and the words that he said, that's the Father. And the things that he did, that was the Father in every aspect. And his relationships, everything was to declare the Father. And Jesus declares that as well in John chapter 14. is one of many passages where Jesus says that that is the, the reason why he came. John chapter 14 beginning with verse 7. If you had known me, you would have known my father also, and from now on you know him and have, and have seen him. And Philip said to him, Lord, show us the father, and it is sufficient for us. You know, he's been with him that long, still doesn't understand. Verse 9, Jesus said to him, Have I been with you so long, and yet you have not known me, Philip? He who has seen me has seen the father, so how can you say, show us the father? If you've seen me, you've seen the Father. If you've heard me, you've heard the Father. So Jesus' purpose, first and foremost, was to come here and to be the exact representation of the Father. Second purpose why Jesus came was to do the Father's will slash work. And it's all the same. And so let's look at several passages having to do with that. And especially, uh, we're going to stay in the book of John for that. Uh, John has a lot of different passages where Jesus... Uh, is, let's that be known. In John chapter 4, you have the Samaritan woman there at the well. Jesus is talking with her while his disciples go into the city to find food. And uh, she gets excited and goes and tells her friends and everything. Every, uh, let me tell you about a man who's told me everything that, uh, that I ever knew, uh, everything that I've ever done. And so his disciples come back to him. They're concerned about him being hungry. So they're trying to encourage and urge him to, to eat. And he says, well, I have food that you don't know about. And it's kind of comical almost because they're looking around and they're saying, does anybody, you know, anybody feed him? And so that is the context. In verse 34, he declares, my food is to do the will of him who sent me and to finish his work. And so it's to do his will, but it is also to do his work. And he says this in several different places. Go into the next chapter, chapter 5. And there it's when uh, he's talking about the resurrection. He's just healed somebody. 
uh, blind and he's talking about the resurrection in verse 28 and 29 and about there's going to be a final resurrection, those who are righteous to eternal life, those who are wicked to eternal damnation. And then he says in verse 30, I can of myself do nothing. And in other words, this is not, not me. As I hear, I judge. And my judgment is righteous because I do not seek my own will, but the will of my Father who sent me. So once again, he's declaring that my job here, my purpose, if you will, is to do the will of the Father and to do the work of the Father. Chapter 6, the very next chapter in verse 38, he makes the declaration once again, For I have come down from heaven not to do my own will, but the will of him who sent me. Over and over and over again you see this. Skipping three chapters to chapter 9, you see it again. You have Jesus and his disciples traveling. They come into a city. There's a blind man that's been blind from the time that he was born. And his disciples ask him the question, you know, uh, did this man sin or his parents sin that he was born blind? And Jesus says, uh, neither one of them. It's so that the, the will of God can be done in him. And that's when he says in verse 4, I must work the works of him who sent me. So there he says works. Uh, while it is day, the night is coming when no one can work. And so Jesus' will, Jesus' uh, purpose here on this earth was to come and to show us the Father in every aspect, but also to do the will and the work of the Father. And so the next question is this, what is his work? What is his work? And so the first one we're going to look at is 1 Timothy chapter 2. Now, when I was doing this lesson, I thought this would make a wonderful series, just looking at the work of the Son. And so, if you like it, we might expand on this and, and look at all of these different things in much, much more detail. But tonight, let's look at the, the work. He, he came for the purpose of doing His will, doing His work. What is that work? Let's look at several things tonight. And by doing so, we're just going to look at probably one scripture for each one and, and think about it. By doing so, we know what he did, but we also are encouraged about what our Lord and Savior did for us, and then we'll make application. So first of all, he was and is our mediator. So 1 Timothy chapter 2 and verse 4, it says that God desires all men to be saved and to come to the knowledge of the truth. For there is one God, one mediator between God and man, and that is the man Christ Jesus he is our mediator. A mediator, of course, going between two people that are at odds or two groups, whatever, and bringing them back into a good relationship. You say, well, why in the world would I need a mediator? It's because of sin, right? Isaiah 59 and verse 2, uh, it just calls it a different word there, but it says that our iniquities separate us from God. In Romans chapter 5 and verse 10, there it also calls us uh, an enemy of God because of our sin. And then it says that, but we are reconciled to God through His Son, Jesus Christ. Beautiful passage. And so He is our mediator. Does anybody have any connections with the President of the United States? Does anybody want a connection with the President of the United States? That'd be a good question. You know, we have to have the right kind of connections. That's a very powerful office and position. And so not just anybody can go and access and, and go. You, you can't just go to the White House and say, hey, I want to see the President and get, get in to see him. Uh, you, have to have, you have to go through the proper channels, right? You have to know the right people and all of that to be able to see somebody that important. Does anybody here have access to the creator of the universe? Every single one of us does through Jesus Christ. Isn't that amazing? So he is our mediator. That's the first thing. The second work that, that we read about is that he is also our purifier. He purifies us. The Hebrew writer says in chapter 1, in verse 3, he had by himself purged our sins, sat down at the right hand of the majesty on high. That word purge there, it means to rid, to remove, to cleanse, to purify. And it says that he has purged our sins, he's removed our sins, he's cleansed us of our sins. Isn't that wonderful? Well, how did that come about? Well, it's through his blood, right? 
Many different passages teach that. Revelation, of course, we've been looking at Revelation a lot on Sunday morning. In chapter 7 and verse 14, you have John seeing this vision of heaven, and here's all of these that are clothed in white robes. The question is asked, who are these who are clothed in white robes? And the answer is given, these are those who have come out of great tribulation and washed their robes and made them white in the blood of the Lamb. That cleansing Ephesians 1 and verse 7 and Colossians 1 and verse 14, both of those passages says that in Him, capital H, talking about Jesus, we have redemption through His blood, the forgiveness of sin. And then we continue to have that in 1 John 1 and verse 7 when He says that if we walk in the light as He is in the light, we have fellowship with one another and the blood of Jesus Christ cleanses us from all sin. Peter says in 1 Peter 1, 18 and 19 that we're not redeemed with corruptible things like silver and gold from our aimless conduct delivered to us by our fathers, but with the precious blood of Jesus Christ as a lamb without blemish and without spot. In Acts chapter 22, you have Ananias in verse 16 telling Saul to, Why are you waiting? Why tarriest thou? Arise and be baptized and wash away your sins, calling on the name of the Lord. 2 Corinthians 5 and verse 21, there you have a passage that says that how, how this is done. You say, how does, uh, does blood cleanse us? Well, Leviticus 17 and verse 11 says that it is, the blood is made for atonement. That's why it is shed. And so it is for a covering, an atonement, a covering for our sins. In 2 Corinthians 5 and verse 21, there it says that he made him, talking capital H, talking about Jesus, he made him who knew no sin to be sin for us that we might become the righteousness of God through him. And so he is our purifier. He has cleansed us from our sin. That's the second job. The third is that he is our liberator. So he is our mediator, bringing us back to God. He is our purifier, cleansing us of our sins. And then thirdly, he is our liberator. Hebrews chapter 2 is a passage there. Y'all are going to get real bored if you don't look at these passages. Hebrews chapter 2, y'all turn and look. Verse 14 and 15. I kind of miss the good old days when you could hear the pages. You can still hear some of that, but so many people are on their phones, which is fine, of course, but it's not the same, don't seem like. For the preacher, it's not the same because you don't hear all of that. Hebrews chapter 2, verse 14 and 15. Inasmuch then as uh, the children have partakers of flesh and blood, he himself likewise shared in the same, that through death he might destroy him who had the power over death, that is, the devil, and release those who through fear of death were all their lifetime, here it is, subject to bondage. They were subject to bondage. How is that? Because of sin leading to death. Romans 6, 23, the wages of sin is death. In John chapter 8, Jesus talks about that, talking about uh, being liberated from sin, the being in bondage of sin, talking about those Jews being in bondage to sin. And they certainly didn't understand, you know, that we're, we've never been in bondage, you know, never mind they've been slaves, you know, for 400 years before that, but he wasn't even talking about it in a physical way. And there in chapter 8 and verse 36 is when he tells them that if the Son sets you free, you will be free indeed. And what he's talking about is liberated. Liberated from sin. What a feeling that is. Do you remember what it felt like way back? Go back most of you in your mind's eye for many, many years ago when you obeyed the gospel of Jesus Christ and you had that weight lifted. Man, I can, I can remember coming up out of the water just beside myself. I mean, I was just crying. I was so excited, but it was just so moving. I can remember that. My granddad baptized me. And even though I grew up in the church, I had been gone my own way for a long time. I knew what was right, but I had to find out for myself. And, and that was truly liberating for me, knowing that and understanding that ever all of those, uh, those things that nobody else knows about, all of that had been, I'd been set free from that, had been liberated from that. And that's a wonderful feeling. We need to thank them continuously for that. Number four, another work is that he is our helper. I love that. He is our helper. He didn't just, you know, we could have had a God that just created us and then just left us, you know. Um, we don't have a, a God like that. I was trying to think of uh, what was the religion 
that basically God deism, that, that like God created everybody, kind of wound up the, the world like a clock and just kind of lets it go and he doesn't interfere and nor does he care, right? And that's not who our God is at all. So he helps us. He helps us on a day-to-day -day basis. Hebrews chapter 2. Look at that passage in it, and it talks about that. It's very encouraging. Hebrews chapter 2, verse 17 and 18. He is our helper. Therefore, in all things he has been made like his brethren, talking about his creation, talking about us, that he might be a merciful and faithful high priest in things pertaining to God to make propitiation. That simply means to appease the wrath of God against, of course, uh, sin for the sins of the people. Verse 18, he says, For in that he himself has suffered being tempted, he is able to aid those who are tempted. So even when you go through times in your life that maybe you think nobody else understands, nobody else, and maybe nobody else even knows about something that you're going through, he can help you. He is there to help you out. And that is a, a job that he has as part of his purpose for coming here. And, and I love it that, that he is co-creator. Colossians 1 verse 16, John chapter 1 tells us that. But not only is he co-creator, but he is our Savior, having died on the cross for us. But not only that, he continues to sit at the right hand of God and make propitiation for our sins. 1 John 2 verse 1 and 2. And then one of these days, he is going to deliver the kingdom, that is the Lord's church, the saved, to the Father, 1 Corinthians chapter 15. And so he, he's continuously at work. He has many purposes, and they're for us as his creation. It's a wonderful thing. He is, number five, he is a sanctifier. He is a sanctifier. Hebrews chapter 10 is our passage there, if you'd like to turn there. His purpose is to do God's will, God's work. His work has many different facets. And the fifth one here is that he is our sanctifier. Sanctify, to be set apart from something that's sin, to be set apart for something that is, of course, to be a child of God, to belong to him, to have a purpose. As Ephesians 2 and verse 10 says, the workmanship created in Christ Jesus uh, for good works. Hebrews chapter 10 and verse 9 says, Then he said, Behold, I have come to do your will, O God. He takes away the first that he may establish the second. He takes away the old covenant to establish the new covenant. He takes away animal sacrifices that, according to Hebrews 10 and verse 4, could never actually take away sins, to give Jesus himself as the perfect sacrifice. And so it says in verse 10, By that will... We have been sanctified through the offering of the body of Jesus Christ once and for all. It's not something that had to be done over and over again, like the law of Moses, to roll those sins forward, if you will. And then, skip into verse 14. It says, For by one offering he has perfected forever those who are being, there's our word, sanctified. And so he's cleansing us for sanctification, for a purpose, and that is what we're getting to in just a moment. Now go to chapter 13 there in that same book in Hebrews and look at verse 12. And it also indicates the same thing there. 13 and verse 12, Therefore Jesus also, that he might sanctify the people with his own blood, we've already talked about that, suffering outside the gate. What that's talking about is during the Old Testament, the animal sacrifices were done in the camp with the people, but after those sacrifices were made, those burnt sacrifices were taken away from the people to be destroyed because it represented sin. And that sin, it was a symbolism, representation of taking the sin away. And so, therefore, he, he suffered away from his people. He was all alone. He didn't have anybody there when he suffered and died for us. So he sanctified us. So Jesus' purpose, as we talked about tonight, first of all was to explain God to us, to be the express image of God. Secondly, to do his will or his work. And we talked about how he is our mediator, bringing us back to God and to a good relationship, our purifier of sin, a liberator of sin, a helper through the trials of life and the troubles and the temptations and also a sanctifier so that we can belong to him and have what we're talking about tonight, 
a purpose. You know, we're created for a purpose. The saddest life ever is that life that, that has no purpose or a per person does not understand that they do have a purpose. Our purpose, and this is a message, this part especially, I think, that so many people need to hear today is that our purpose in life is not self-gratification, believe it or not. You know, I am all for having a good time. Uh, you can ask anybody. I'm all for having a good time. I'm all for laughs. You know, I'm, I'm all for enjoying life. And even the better things of life, he, he, made, uh, he, he made all of those things, you know. John 10 and verse 10, he came that, he, that we would have life and have it more abundantly. And even in the context there, he's talking about this life. He's not even referring to the abundant life that we have in the hereafter. But that's not our purpose in life. So what is our purpose? Well, look at, let's look at about three different passages very quickly to see what our purpose is. It's, if it's not just here to, to let's eat, drink, and, and, and party and have a good time, and li that's it, and life's over, then what is it? Well, Paul says this, inspired by the Holy Spirit in Colossians 3 and verse 23, that whatever you do in word or deed, do it heartily to the Lord and not to man. That's purpose, is it not? Whatever you do, the words you say, the actions you the, the interactions you have with people, every aspect of your life, do it heartily. That is wholeheartedly for the Lord. That is to glorify Him. That's purpose. That's what He's talking about there. Another passage, Jesus in John chapter 15 talks, I think, about our purpose and speaks to that when He's talking about the vine and the branches here. And He says in John 15 and verse 8, He says, By this my Father is glorified, that you bear much fruit. That's purpose, is it not? Now to bear, to be able to do that, I have to belong to him. If you go back a few verses there to verse 5, it talks about how the vine, you know, without the, the branches, without the vine is nothing. It's dead, and we know that. We understand that in an agricultural type way. But so the same is true as without me, you can do nothing is what he says there. So we have to belong to him first and foremost, but then our purpose is to glorify him in the way that we live and to bear much fruit for him. That's purpose. That's why we're here. Matthew chapter 5 and verse 16 on the Sermon on the Mount. Let your light so shine among men that they may see your good works and what? Glorify your Father in heaven. That's purpose. Every bit of our life. So let me leave you with this this evening. Are you fulfilling your purpose? Are you fulfilling your purpose? None of us are doing it perfectly, but are you striving to fulfill your purpose? Do you understand what your purpose is? Well, I think we all do. It's to glorify God in every aspect of our life. We still have a good time. We still have fun. We have relationships. We have work. And all of those things are, are a part of life. Our hobbies and the, and the things that we do like that is all a part of our life. However, when those things keep us from our purpose, and that is to glorify God, then we're getting our priorities mixed up. Our purpose is to glorify God. So we need, we need to know that. We need to accept that. We need to embrace that. And we need to work wholeheartedly for that in our life. So I want to encourage you this week to go out and fulfill your purpose. If you have a need this evening, if you feel like you're not right with God because you have not yet obeyed the gospel of Jesus Christ, then we can certainly take care of that by baptizing you in the name of the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit, and you will be in a saved condition. If you as a child of God are struggling with something and your friends, you, your family are here to pray with you and for you, if we can help you, let us know while together we stand and sing.